Good morning, and welcome to the Kingdom of Grace Ministries Bible Study. Uh, today is a beautiful day, and the day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice, and uh, we will enjoy it and rejoice in it, by the way. We'll be glad and rejoice in it. I'm sorry I missed my words up, but uh, I tell you what, today is just, um, I, I wake up in the morning, there's something about Sunday morning, you know. Uh, I think the Commodores had a song that said, Easy Like Sunday Morning. So I'll tell you what, Sunday morning is always a good day for me. And then uh, this is a time that we reflect and celebrate and, and begin to uh, reverence and give God praise. Now we also are required uh, by the Word of God is to keep the Sabbath, to keep it holy. We understand and know that Sunday is typically not the Sabbath. It's uh, Saturday is in the Jewish custom. Um, but we're still supposed to reflect and reflect upon the time and take time out to rest in the Lord. So in this day of the joy the Lord has made, we will be glad and rejoice in it. Praise the Lord. This morning, um, I want to just start off with some words of encouragement to some of you all that are out there that's going through some things. And, and before we get into the Bible study and, and uh, talk about today's uh, topic, I want you to be encouraged. Uh, let's go to the Bible. I'm just going to go to the Bible and read some scriptures for words of encouragement for some of you all. I think it's necessary because so many people are going through uh, so many different things with so many different, um, uh, different situations. <clears throat> so I just want to read this a little bit. And then uh, I'll read a couple of scriptures and then I'll uh, move forward. It says, I'm in Psalms 91. It says, He who dwells in the shelters of the Most High will abide in the shadows of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. For it is He who delivers you from the snares of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. I'm going to stop right there, and, and so you, I just want you to be encouraged and to trust the Lord. Uh, without God, we have nothing. Um, I tell, I make a statement all the time that says, um, uh, uh, "Success without Christ is suicide." And I mean, I meant that then when I came up, when I said it. I mean, it, I mean it now when I say it. Uh, another scripture, uh, Psalms 30. Psalms 30. It says, I will told you, O Lord, you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You have kept me alive that I would not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord. You, his godly ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. Now, as for me, I say, in my prosperity, I will never be moved. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Again, these are words of encouragement to you all this morning. Uh, just to, uh, you know, I think about these things and sometimes, you know, what God asks me to teach on and to deliver to you is not always words of encouragement. Sometimes it's words of warning because of what God is putting in my heart these days. But still, I want to make sure that everybody understands that I encourage you to hold on to God's enchanting hand. Uh, hold on to what you have. That's what Jesus said in Revelation. I know that you have just a little strength, but hold on to what you have. Uh, one last word of encouragement, uh, Psalms 1. <clears throat> it says, How blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scorpions, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by a stream of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaves do not wither. And whatsoever he does, he 
prosperous. Again, be encouraged this morning. Thank God for his grace and his mercy. Again, um, before we go into prayer, I want to begin talking about the purpose of my teachings today. Uh, really, I've been hovering around um, uh, Zechariah, the 14th chapter. I've been staying there, and we kind of uh, and we talk about living in a spiritual catastrophe. Living in a spiritual catastrophe. Um, the purpose of this teaching is to give you insight and also to tie the Old Testament to the New Testament when you go into Revelation about the things of the end time and the end time prophecies. Uh, what's happening today and what you see today in the world, the catastrophes you're seeing on a daily basis, it's amazing how instead of pulling us closer to God, it's pulling us farther away from God and it's also dividing us amongst ourselves, which says that the Bible is true, no matter even though those who know the truth, those who know and understand what the Bible is saying, it's, it's not having any effect on you to do better and to be better. And part of that reason is because Jesus Christ himself prophesied the falling of the way, uh, falling away of the church, and we see it, we're experiencing it, we're part of it, and we're even helping create some of it. And so because of that, um, Jesus prophesied and therefore because of his prophetic word you can undo what God prophesied. You cannot undo what Jesus prophesied. The real meat of it all is for us to have it in our hearts to hold on to God's unchanging hand no matter what. The Bible said if it was possible even the very elect would be deceived. And we're not going to be deceived, and we're not going to be talking about different things that's going to cause us to be deceived. Um, you know, um, as, as I say this, I say this with, with all sincerity of heart, is that nowadays, while everybody want to get back to church and get into a church setting, I'm finding that what's most important to God is your personal praise, your personal worship, your personal time with God. Do you have any? Are you making time for God? You know the answer to that. I'm not going to be here and try to judge anyone on, on what's right or what's wrong, but you already know the answer to that. And if you're more concerned with the cares of this world, more concerned with things that are going around you, more concerned with coronavirus, more concerned with all the things that's happening around you, more than your personal praise and relationship with God. That's your answer. And, uh, and, I, and I say this to, this particularly to Christians. Do not confuse faith with fear, number one. Number two, don't lie to yourself and say that you're concerned about something when in actuality it's a worry. Because you may not sin like others, but if you are worrying about a lot of things, the Bible said that is sin because you know better. And again, it's the faith that you have in God, no matter what is going on, is what's going to stand and what's going to last. Um, the, the, we walk by faith, not by sight. So let us pray. Father, we thank you today for your grace and your mercy. Uh, thank everybody, Lord, that support this ministry through their words of encouragement. That support this ministry, Lord, through their tithes and their offering. That support this ministry, Lord God, through their kind deeds and their prayers. That support this ministry, Lord God, with but whatever their hands find to do, that they do it. Oh, I, I, I think about, Lord, so many names I can call right now, even on this broadcast, of those that weather the storm and that's doing all that they can do, Lord, day in and day out, to keep this ministry functioning well and keep this ministry, Lord God, relevant. We thank you for all of the ones that I'm mentioning, Lord God, even though they don't call out their name. Thank you for the Kingdom of Grace Ministries family 
and friends, Lord God, that support us, that's always here for us. We thank you. I want to take time out to, you know, pray for the bereaved families of loved ones that have gone on to be with the Lord here recently. Uh, just the other day, I mean, just yesterday, we buried one of my cousins, and uh, we pray for their family, pray their strength in the Lord. We, we just thank you, Lord, for everything. We praise you, God, for who you are. The sick, the shed in, we pray for them right now, Lord God. Don't let them be discouraged. Lord God, uh, every person that you put on our hearts, help us to pick up the phone, to send a text, to make a phone call, uh, to reach out to somebody that you're laying on our hearts, Lord God, because it may be that moment that would be a transformation in their lives. So we thank you for that. We pray, God Almighty, for healing, Lord God, for all the undergoing pain and suffering right now. We're praying right now, Lord God Almighty, for our nation. We pray for the President of the United States of America. We pray for humanity in general, Lord God, that you will open up our eyes to see that God is awesome and you're still on the throne and, you, and that you're still in control. We pray, God, for the Americans and our allies that are uh, still located in Afghanistan. We're saying bring our people home safely. Uh, we thank you, God, for hearing our prayers. We thank you, God, for us today. We're praying, God, teach us, Lord, the word that you want us to hear and know fully. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless y'all on that. And again, I, I have commentary. I always have some commentary before I get started. But one of the first things we want to talk about is, is coronavirus as well, the Delta variant. Uh, my commentary is simple. Uh, please make sure that you are uh, taking care of others. If you're not going to be responsible for yourself, be responsible for others, uh, people in your care. Uh, I know people talk about, uh, I don't know, I've heard so many different things and I kind of wrote some of them down. Uh, you know, I'm not taking the Delta variant because they have a computer chip in, in that virus, uh, or in that bio, or they're trying to kill us, or they have, they're killing off certain kinds of people. I've heard this as clear as yesterday, and I'm like, instead of um, arguing with someone, I said, for every a negative uh, impact that you've witnessed or you've heard about, I can show you a positive one. And, and I try to do that in a very um, clear light. Um, to answer the questions for somebody that's talking about there's a computer chip in the, in the, um, in the uh, uh, vaccinations, uh, I'm, I'm saying, and in, in putting pennies and you know, radioactive stuff to see if it sticks to you, um, magnets and all that. Let me say something. If you got a cell phone, if you carry a cell phone out 24-7, then that's your computer chip right there. The, the government, the Antichrist, even we, we ourselves can track you all over the world with your phone because most people keep their phone on them. So you don't need, you don't have a need for a microchip. Why? Because you carry your phone on you all the time. So let's, let's be mindful of the things that we say and what we believe. Again, this is my time for commentary. The second thing that I want to make a comment on, and this is my own comments now, uh, and, and I'm not going to be one that says the law told me. I'm not doing that. This is my own personal commentary. Uh, we see right now the criticism around the world about what we've done in, in Afghanistan and all those things. Uh, let, me, let me say something very clear. In that region, those people are Muslims. And the Afghans and Taliban's, um, they, uh, uh, they range from being secular Muslims all the way to extremists. As you know, the Taliban itself, they, are, they believe in Sharia law, which is of the stream of the most extremes. We know people that have fought in Afghanistan, been in Afghanistan, and no matter what, uh, they had to be mindful, even of the ones that claim to, to have been our allies. Why do I say that? I say that because don't forget that in that region, 
Their religion is everything. Their religion is everything. In their religion, in the teachings that they have, they believe uh, one thing. You either will convert or you will die. If you do not convert, then you will die. And they believe that with all their hearts, no matter if you're secular or no matter if you're experienced. If they cannot convert you, then the goal is to annihilate you and to wipe you off the face of the earth. And it will take no matter. It doesn't matter. I will be your friend for one day or I will be your friend for a hundred years. But at that hundred and one day, a hundred and one year, that is time for me to take over and I find the opportunity to, to annihilate you, I will do it. And you, we need to keep that in perspective when we start thinking about politics. It's not about politics. The reason why we keep getting it wrong around the world is because we do not put their religion first. Religion is very important to these people. And you have to know that. And what we try to do is try to put the humanity uh, humanitarian, uh, humanitarian face on it, which is what we should do. But keep in mind, they don't think like you think. They don't think like we think. And so at the end of the day, if there's an opportunity to annihilate every American over in that region, along with those that help them, they will do so. So keep that in mind. I'm not saying this because this is um, my point of view. This is the point of view of the Muslim who their goal is to wipe out all Jews and all Christians off the face of the earth. And that has not changed. There is no sense of coexistence with other religions. There are those, their religion is to dominate. And if you don't know that today and understand that today, um, then you'll never know. Why is America keep getting it wrong? Because we try to put rationale and reasoning on things that they're driven strictly by their religion. So again, that's my commentary for the day. Uh, now I'm going to get into living in a spiritual catastrophe. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn back with me to the 14th chapter of Zechariah. And um, I'm going to start at verse number 6. But my main point I want to start today is verse number 9. I just want to kind of recap a little bit. But go to uh, uh, Zechariah 14 chapter. We're going to start at verse number 6, reading 6 through 8, and then we're going to really get into what I want to talk about in verse number 9. So my Bible, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible today, uh, this is one of my favorite study Bibles. It says, in that day, there will be no light, the luminaries will dwindle, but it will be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night. But it will come about that at evening time there will be light. And in that day, living water will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them towards the east sea and the other half towards the western sea. It will be in summer as well as winter. Verse number nine. Uh, I have a heading on the box that says, God will be king over all. It says number nine, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be the only one and his name the only one. All the land will be changed into a plain from Geba, Ageba, to Remnon, Remnon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site from Benjamin's gate as far as the place of the first gate to the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine press. People will live in it and there will no longer be a curse for Jerusalem will dwell in security. Here is a passage that we've been talking about, reading about, on how God will be king over all. But we know God will be king over all through Jesus Christ himself. Here is in the Old Testament, you find that Zechariah is really giving you an insight as Jesus Christ is returning back to the earth to reign 1,000 years with his saints that are coming with him and also to be king over the earth. 
One point that I really want you to see in verse number nine, it says, and the Lord will be king over all the earth, and in that day will be the only one, and his name the only one. Let me be clear about that. What it's simply saying is there will be the, there will be only one religion, one religion. There will be no longer any other religions where people will be able to argue about religion. It will be just one religion. Uh, in the entire world in the millennial reign of Christ and he will rule with the rod of iron. Christ will have done away with all false religions. He will have done away with everything uh, uh, that is spawned by Satan. And I think that I have to say hallelujah on that because at this time you'll be living in a time of truth. Living in a time where things will be happening in real time on the earth. And, and it would be only one religion, one God, one faith, one religion, one baptism. And I thank God for that because at the end of the day, you won't have to be confused with falsehoods or uh, anything being false and unreal. So we thank God for his grace in that. It goes on to say, all the land will be changed into the plain from Geba to Memon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site. Now, this is a scene, and if those who have never been to Jerusalem, you don't go down to Jerusalem, you go up to Jerusalem. And it's kind of like uh, describing it. It's kind of like here it is, this city that will be up on a mountain or sitting up on a hill. As it's sitting up on a hill, uh, uh, Zach Zechariah describes it. He's saying that, that, uh, Remain on his site from Benjamin's gate as far as from the place of the new gate, first gate, to the corner gates. And if you look at the city of David and how to get into Jerusalem, they have, they, they're identifying the gates or the 12 gates. And one of the things that's always exciting about this is where you see it talks about the gates right now in the Bible or in the Old Testament. These gates still exist today in 2021. That is super amazing to me. And which says to me, if you really don't understand your future, you need to understand something about Jerusalem. And one of the problems I have with the church scene today is that we teach and tell people about everything, but we don't teach and tell people about Jerusalem and the importance of Jerusalem for us. Whether you've been to Jerusalem or not, that's not the point here. The point is, how do you educate yourself on Jerusalem? Not just New Jerusalem, but Jerusalem as it exists today, because the things that's happening in Jerusalem will dictate what is, will be happening in your future as we move closer to not only the rapture, but as we move closer towards the, um, uh, uh, the period of the tribulation. And you need to understand these things. One of the things that I... Um, I see in the Bible, and, and we don't talk about a whole lot, is I begin to ask people this, not only people that are of Christianity or Christians, but I ask circular people, people who their worldview is a secular view. And when I, and the question I usually ask them is, uh, is the world getting any better? Will it get better? What say you? And it's amazing how many Christians say, oh, one day the world is going to get better. And I'm saying getting better in what sense? Are you talking about as the return of Christ? Or are you saying that things are going to get better in general before that time? And they all seem to have hope that things will get better just on a regular basis. And where I'm a little surprised by that, this says to me that really not reading the Bible from a prophetic eye. Because the Bible is clear. Jesus said even over 2,000 years ago that these are the beginning of sorrow. You know, wars and rumors of wars are the beginning of sorrow. And then 2,000 years later, we're still saying the same thing as if nothing changed within 2,000 years. And I'm saying right now, you look at, you look at the hurricane season that we know about. Uh, it's amazing because I'm used to this. We know this is hurricane season. And how many people today do not have their cars gassed up and full of gasoline. I mean, they're sitting on E. If they had to run to the hills right now, they probably couldn't even make it because their gasoline tank is 
empty. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the world is telling you to be prepared, especially when you live on the Gulf Coast, be prepared for a hurricane at any moment. We looked at Hurricane Grace bearing down. We looked at uh, Unray. Uh, you got one that's bearing down, Un I think Unray right now, Henry, however you want to call it, is hitting up the west, uh, hitting up the east coast right now. You're having uh, Grace that just, you know, just uh, 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 shot across the Yucatan. You had the one before that uh, uh, that shot straight up uh, Florida. I mean, come on. I mean, what more do it take when you've been through the season all along to be prepared? What are you saying, Pastor? If you cannot be prepared for a hurricane in hurricane season, how can you be prepared for the rapture? How can you be prepared for the things that's coming on this earth if you don't even have any discernment for natural things? How do you have discernment for spiritual things? And again, too often, you know, the church is saying hallelujah and want to get together and praise God in a corporate sense. But God is not looking for a corporate praise right now. He's not looking for a corporate worship right now. What God is trying to get us to is a personal praise and personal time with him so we can be in a better position to hear from God directly. Not even from preachers and pastors, what God is using today, but God is saying the Holy Spirit will connect you individually once you understand what thus says the Lord. And you will know that those that are preaching and talking about certain topics, they're on point because you feel it in your spirit. Now that you feel it in your spirit, it's connecting you to the things of God it is not so much just trying to see somebody so you can get back at church. Uh, let me make this point right quick while I said that. Is that I noticed that uh, just recently, like I said yesterday, you know, we had a reunion. I had a uh, service, a memorial service for my cousin who passed away and uh, from cancer. And we prayed and thanked God for the good reports that we heard. And, and a wonderful, beautiful service. And, and I thought about something, you know, uh, somebody said, well, you know, I hate that we have to meet this way. And I said, no, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't hate it. I'm glad that we can meet together. If it's through death that we can celebrate life, I'm okay with us meeting together because so, everybody's so busy doing their own thing, going around different places and time, that it seems like the only time we can get together when there is a funeral. A celebration of life. And if that's what it takes for us to get together to say howdy, howdy, and how are you doing, and for us to fellowship, then uh, let it be so, as long as we are coming together. I know that may not be the prettiest scene, and everybody wants to do a family reunion, but right now, family reunions, you have to be very careful who's coming to the family reunion. Okay, let me go back to my corona hat, you know, I don't want to have a family reunion for those that are not respectful for the elders. Those that are older, you know, right now, especially in Delta uh, variant, if you don't have your shots and you come around the person, then you're breathing on it. They don't have any protection from, from coronavirus, then just your mere presence, if you're, if, if you're infected, your infection can infect them even to the point of death. You don't want to be responsible for that. You really don't. Same thing with children. You know, children have a stronger immune system, but we're seeing right now through Delta variant that even children are getting sick. Now, what, what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying again that this is what you would consider a pestilence. It is a pandemic, but it's a pestilence. It is a virus. It is something that is allowed to happen, not only in one particular place, but it's happening all around the world. And if it's happening all around the world, imagine, is God in control or is God out of control? Does God have no control of Delta variant or is God allowing COVID-19 to serve his will and his purpose? I mean, it's just something to think about because sometimes we forget that God is still in control. And God has always, through eons of time, used pestilence, used diseases, use things to accomplish his will when man does not listen. And we always find these things to happen when man has turned to science and turned their backs away from God. We're so heavy into the science 
that nobody is saying, let us pray to God. We're so busy into explaining all the scientific and the moving parts of that. Nobody said, let us pray and repent and return back to God. And maybe God will do something about these diseases and do something about this pestilence. You have not heard the clergy say that. You have not heard anybody say that publicly. And I'm saying we probably need to turn back to God, ask God to forgive us of all our sins as a nation, as nations, and then say, God, show us what we need to do to correct this matter. Well, I'm just saying, that's just something you know, I'm talking about. Let's go back to number 12, or number 11. Here it says, people will give in, people will live in it. By my Jerusalem, there will no longer be a curse, for Jerusalem will dwell in, in security. Look at number 12. Now, this will be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who have gone to war against Jerusalem. Let me stop right there. It's saying that there's coming a day and a time that Jerusalem will live in peace and safety and security. And when that happens is when Jesus Christ set foot on the Mount of Olives. If you go back to Zechariah, the 14th chapter, it says in verse number 3, Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as with when he fights on a day of battle. In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in the front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from east to west by a very large valley. So the half of the mountain will move forward in the north, and the other half towards the south. Now, I say, wow, this is pretty clear. We kind of spelled it out last Sunday. This is Jesus coming back to the earth and setting foot on where he left. And when we read in the book of Acts, he said, why do men of Galilee, why stand here engaging in the sky? The same Jesus who ascended up from you is coming right back to the same spot. Coming right back to the same spot. You see Zechariah saying, you see in the books of Acts that it was a, a, a confirmed we know that this is a scene that is coming, that is going to happen. But it cannot happen until, until the, the, the temple is built in Jerusalem. And people, we don't talk about that. People know nothing about the temple. The people in Jerusalem right now, the people in Israel right now have all of the, they have all of the uh, materials it will take to build their brand new temple. They're, they have the menorah. The menorah is sitting out in a public square with, with security over it. The people can see it's a golden menorah. Um, it's, it's magnificent. Uh, I, I took pictures of it. I went into some of the places where they are, are preparing for the the, uh, uh, the braziers, the fire, and things. They have all this stuff sitting here waiting to happen. They have the priests that have been, that they've identified the priests in their lineage. Uh, from the priesthood of Aaron all the way up to now has been identified and they're just sitting down waiting on the Messiah to come. It's amazing. Not only that, even the heifer, uh, the red heifer that they use to, to, uh, to sacrifice on the altars in the temple, they have identified the DNA of that heifer and they're able to, to reproduce that heifer uh, exactly like in the times of, of the sacrifices. It's amazing. And today, uh, we go along with our lives in the day with all this chaos going on, but we still have to remember that God is still in control. Again, living in a spiritual catastrophe. Living in a spiritual catastrophe. Let's talk about Haiti. It's amazing how you don't hear very much about Haiti. And there's two reasons for that. You look at one reason is because it's predominantly black. It's one reason. You don't hear about this. The second reason is their predominant religion is voodoo. I'm not saying that everybody in Haiti practice voodoo, but that is not true. Uh, there are a lot of Christians in Haiti today, and and just as it affected the voodoo, the, the, the people who worship voodoo, it affected the Christians. And then they had the hurricane that came through uh, that affected them, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, tropical storm. I mean, one after the uh, other. And you have devastation, the lives of people over there. So the humanitarian need 
in Haiti is great, regardless of who they are and what they're doing and whether they're Christians or non-Christians. We have an obligation that though to help those, um, you know, as people, as people of God, we are, you know, do what you can to help uh, in every sense of that word. But then you have to look at mankind, how we focus on news. We focus on the news media, or the, or the flavor of the day news, but you have all these other things happening. And then not only with the tropical storm, they had earthquakes. Again, Jesus said, you have earthquakes, wars, and rumors of wars. But now you're having something not happening 2,000 years ago that's happening right here in the day and time. You see that earthquakes all over the world that's affecting us today. Global warming, how what's happening with global warming and how the weather patterns are just so inconsistent in so many different parts of the world. But we have to think about these things and know that Jesus Christ and God is still in control. Thank God to his glory in his name. He says, number 11, people will live in Jerusalem. There will no longer be a curse in Jerusalem. And you think about it right now. In Jerusalem, the majority of the people, um, well, even though the, some of the Orthodox, but well, not everybody's Orthodox, you have a large population of people in Israel that are secular. And not only secular, some of them don't even believe in God. Or oh, they're agnostic. Well, they believe in God, but they don't worship God, they don't serve Him in any form or fashion. Let alone believe in Jesus Christ. Most, most Jews, majority of Jews, 99.9, I would say 99.2, the percent of the Jews do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And so they know nothing about Christianity. They know nothing about Christianity. And so with that said, we want to make sure that we are doing the things that are necessary for us, for us to teach ourselves, to govern ourselves about the Word of God, knowing what the Bible is saying. That is one of the reasons, one of the purposes that I chose Zechariah, the 14th chapter. It's not talking about the past. This is something that's talking towards and moving us towards the future. Things that you need to know about. Number 12. Verse number 12 says, Now this will be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who have gone to war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet, and their eyes will rot in their socket." and their tongue will rot in their mouth. It will come about in that day that a great panic from the Lord will fall on them, and they will seize one another hand, and the hand of one will be lifted against the hand of another. Judah also will fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the surrounding nations will be gathered gold and silver. And garments in abundance. So also, like this plague, will be the plagues on the horse, the mule, the camel, the donkey, and all the cattle that will be in those camps. Now, now this is a. Uh, uh, I, I really want to take time to really explain this. The prophet, one final time, cycles back over the judgment that proceeds from the kingdom. He said, God will strike the heathen forces against Israel with the supernatural plague similar to the judgment of the Assyrian army. And this is found back in Isaiah 37 and 36. Causing a panic so great that they began to attack one another. Aiding in the escape of the half, God will enable his people to fight then he will send a widespread plague that even extends not only to the people, but also to their animals. Now think about that for a minute. Think about that for a minute. It's saying that God is the one that has allowed the plague. And when I think about this plague, it almost seems like it's a nuclear explosion, but it's not a nuclear explosion because it's, it's supernatural. If you go back to and I said, uh, go back to Revelation. Go to the 19th chapter. 
Go to the night you count. And if you go to Revelation, the 19th chapter, let's go down to uh, verse number 17. Verse number 17. It says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, small and great. And it goes on to say here, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him. Him who? Against Jesus who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burned with fire with brimstone, excuse me, burned with brimstone. And the rest was killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and uh, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. And I want you to focus on, and the rest was killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him. What do you mean the mouth of him? If you go back, you will see number 15, 1915, it says, from his mouth come a sharp sword, so that with it he strike down the nation and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he tread the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he had a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now we find direct correlation between Zechariah 14 and Revelation, the 19th chapter, that this is Jesus Christ. When he comes, Jesus Christ was open up his mouth and speak a word. And when he speak a word, nobody will have to fight because out of his mouth will come words that are so powerful, it's cutting like a sharp sword that even the, the Bible says that the flesh, the flesh of those, he said, for now, no, I'm back to Zechariah 14, chapter 12, verse, and now this will be the plague of which the Lord will strike all the people who have gone to war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet. Jesus will speak a word and all of a sudden it's like it's like their flesh will just rot like a plague. And all of a sudden they're starting to melt and just to rot on their bones. And as they begin to do this, not only with them, the horses that they're on, the beasts and the food that they brought with them because they come with a serious siege around Jerusalem. And when all this thing happened, the Bible says everything that's associated with that will simply just, just die at the voice of Jesus Christ. And Jesus will call, the angels will call, birds to pray, come and let there be this great feast. Feast of kings. Feast of the, the free. Feast of the slaves. And I'm saying, wow. Well, I know some of you all thinking, wow. Uh, I'm going to be coming with Jesus Christ. Okay, good. That's, that's, that's the point here. The whole idea is for us to make sure that you understand that what you want to be, you want to be coming with Jesus, riding back with Jesus, and not be the recipient of the judgment that's coming from Jesus. And so as you study your Bible, and let me say this, and, and, uh, um, I pray for you, and you pray for me, uh, as I pray for every member of the Kingdom of Grace family and, and those that are in the Christian family, we pray that you will hold on to your salvation. We pray that you will hold on to the hand of God. Now, I'm going to be very clear with this. You know, when you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you have accepted that, therefore, that is eternal. And no one can take that away from you. And you cannot be plucked out of God's hand if you truly have given your life 
and hard to price. Now let me also say, now there's many people that have fell from grace or fallen from grace or not living uh, the life that they should be living. This is not a matter of your salvation or eternal security, if you will. This is a matter of your reward in heaven. You don't want to get to heaven and have no reward because you're not living an overcoming life. And what I try to say to people is that you need to live like this is your last day on earth. And most of us don't do it. Going back to the analogy I gave about the, the, the being ready for hurricane season. Most people are not ready for hurricane season. And yet, the Bible says you need to be ready and the five are wise, five foolish, and the five wise had their lamp trimmed with oil. Do you understand what trimmed with oil means? It's the same thing with having your gas tank filled with gas. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same thing. It's saying be ready as if this is your last day. And if you don't have your gas tank filled up full of gas, that means you're not ready. For what's about to happen in hurricane season. So if you're not ready for hurricane season, how can you be ready for the rapture? Okay, I didn't mean to preach, but, but I'm preaching. That is the problem with the Christian community. We keep saying that we're ready, but we're looking for another day to come. But we're not ready for today. And the reason why we're not ready for today is because we can't even do things that's natural and do things in the natural. How are you going to do things in the spiritual that God has to give you spiritual discernment, which is supernatural? Okay, 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 I'm just saying that because I think this is important to where we got to stop playing with ourselves sometimes because we think of ourselves more highly than what we should be thinking. I have a hunger for, for, for people to be saved, my family particularly. I want all my family members to be saved. I mean, grandchildren, children, Everybody in my sad family to be saved. Cousin, first cousin, second cousin, I want everybody to be saved. But I know that this may not be possible that everybody gets saved, even in your family. At the end of the day, uh, the Bible tells us about Noah. Even Noah, as hard as he tried, only eight souls came with him. It was only eight souls that were saved. And even through all that, uh, when they got to the other side of the flood, they wouldn't, you think they were praising God and worshiping God like you think they should? The Bible said even Noah had, had went out and got drunk uh, for whatever reason. Again, these are the things that we have to be thinking about, that, that Jesus Christ is soon to come. And we have to be ready for that. Uh, let's look at verse 16 in Zechariah 14, uh, 16. Then it will come about that any who are left on the nations they went against Jerusalem, go up from one year to year, worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the feast of booths. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go to Jerusalem to worship, the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. Uh, we're going to talk about that, and I want to get into the discussion about rain. Uh, at another topic. Here is a direct correlation that in the tribulation, uh, excuse me, after the tribulation time and in the reign of the millennial reign, like I said, there's only going to be one religion. There's not going to be all these other religions. There's going to be one religion. and But yet, it's going to be like anything else. You will have free will and you will have, you have free will just like you have free will right now. The people of God you're going to have those that are glorified with glorified bodies. Those that came back with Christ will be glorified. You will have those that have been on the earth and they will, they will enjoy the benefits of long life. They will enjoy the benefits of the curse being lifted. But they are required to worship God and required to sacrifice unto God. And it's saying, even, and the Bible says, even the enemies, it said all families, not enemies, so even the families of, it said, it says, even, it says, uh, and, and number 17, and it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to worship the king, the Lord of hope, there will be no rain upon them. In other words, you will be required to come and pay homage to God through Jesus Christ by coming into a pilgrimage into Jerusalem to worship and they're saying and the main 
point is to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And, and let me read this passage here as I, as I want to make sure I say this right. This is uh, some commentary. It says, this very important passages reveal that some Gentiles will go into the millennial kingdom alive along with the redeemed Jews. A converted remnant from those heathen nations will make annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem to worship the Lord and to celebrate the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacle during the millennial commemoration uh, to, between the uh, uh, millennial commemoration, the time when God tabernacle with Israel into the wilderness. The feast represents the last of the three major pilgrimage festivals marked by the final harvest of the year's crop and provided a time of rejoicing. In the millennial, it will be celebrated it will celebrate Messiah's presence against the dwelling amongst his people and rejoice and joyful restoration of Israel, including the ingathering of the nation. Those who refuse to go will experience drought and plagues. Tragically, as the thousand years go on, there will be many people from all over the world who will reject Christ as Savior and King joining in a final war against them, only to be destroyed and cast into hell forever. And we see this when the Bible says, after the thousand year reign was up, Satan was loose for a short period of time, and he gathered those together to make war against the kingdom of God. And again, we see this in Zechariah in some great detail. And what I'm saying here to us today is that we need to understand that as we look at these things and see the plagues, uh, and see the plagues today, it doesn't mean that things are getting better and they will get better as you think they will. What I see is is continuous a uh, continuing of things going on. When you think something's got better and you'll be taking shots and doing everything that you need to do, these things gonna be morphing like we see it now. We get delta variants. And it's amazing because it's consistent even with the plagues of old when they came out of Egypt. Plague after plague after plague and the hearts of man were still hardened in Egypt. Still hardened. And then even after the plague on the children began to hit, and that's when they paid attention. That's when even Pharaoh paid attention. Look what's happening today through coronavirus. It wasn't even affecting kids. It was affecting old people. And then it was affecting the, junk, the, the, the from 24 to 40 year old generation. And we're still not taking heed to anything. And I was now is affecting our children in school and children are dying. Think about this for a minute. And those that are sitting around saying, I don't want to take the virus for this. I don't want to take the shot for that. I'm saying, forget about all that. Look at what God is saying to us. And what God is doing. And for, if, if you can't see God moving in the midst of a coronavirus, you'll never see God move. At the end of the day, even the Bible tells you, the Bible itself tells you, you have to prepare yourself by putting blood on the mantle. That's something you have to do. That's something you've got to be a part of in order to be part of the solution. Well, God help us today. God help us today. But we get so spiritual. We get so uh, 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 high and mighty about how, well, oh God, uh, I'm not taking it by because you're going to protect me. God is saying, I'm the one that allowed the place to happen. And therefore, it put blood on the mantle. Some of y'all's blood, the, the blood on the mantle is a shock for you. Again, I know that's a stretch for some of y'all, but at the end of the day, I, you know, I'm, I'm a person where, where I, I, you know, I don't mind saying it, that, you know, I have my challenges, my, my health challenges. I'm type 2 diabetes. And therefore, where we'll ask myself, do I want to die? I don't want to die. I don't want to die today. I don't want to die tomorrow. I don't want to die never. I don't ever want to die. I'm that guy that I want to be raptured straight up in the sky without ever seeing that. I want to be part of that group. That's what I'm just telling you. I want to be part of that group. I never experienced death like that. 
So therefore, I'm doing everything I can to leave because death is my enemy. Death is your enemy. And I've witnessed people dying and dying around me. And as a minister, I've buried so many people and watched their last and final days. And I'm telling you, uh, there's nothing pretty about death. Nothing. And I see people take chances, you know, like that don't need to be taken. And I'm saying, what? But anyway, I, I'm, again, this is, I'm, I'm reading from the scripture about plagues. Let me finish. It's number 19. The pun this will be the punishment. Let, let me go back up. 18. If the families of Egypt does not go up or enter, then no rain will fall on them. Uh, again, there will be no rain that will fall. In other words, in a land of plenty, in a land that's truly blessed in Jerusalem and around the world, if you don't come up to visit upon these celebrations of the Feast of Booths and to these, to, to these feasts, the Bible says no rain will fall upon the earth or in your area, in your territory. And if you have no rain, nothing will grow. I mean, it's just that simple. So many people complain about, oh, we got too much rain. You know what I'm saying you can never have too much rain. You never have too much rain. Now, now you, yeah, you might, it might stop you from doing the things you want to do. But at the end of the day, when you have rain, then that's a, that's a sure sign that God is giving water for the ingredients water for the food because not only the food that we eat but the food that our animals eat right and and the vegetables and things that we that grows i mean it's good to have rain amen uh you you look at some places that don't have rain but they wish they had rain and god is saying here in the bible said their punishment will be if they don't go up to show pilgrimage to god then God will withhold the rain from them if they don't go up. Number 20, in that day there will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord, and the cooking pot in the Lord's side will be like a bowl before the altar. Every cooking pot in Jerusalem and in Judah will be holy to the Lord of hosts, and all who sacrifice will come and take up them and boil in them, and there will be no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts in that day. Let me try to explain that. Right now, we claim, like, like as preachers, we say the, the, the sacred altar, right? We say this is the sacred desk, the sacred altar of the Lord, you know, because we're proclaiming the word of God. Uh, you know, the, the holy of holies were to be sacred, that nobody can go behind that. You know, they had to tie a rope around the priest just to track his movements and things like that. But the Bible saying here, in the millennial time, in the rain, it said even the 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 harness the the, the, the harnesses on the bell on the heart is just as holy as the sacred desk that we preach from. Oh, that's that guy. Got chill. Because everything in, in the millennial reign will be holy unto the Lord. Every pot that is used to cook a meal will be holy unto the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Everything that you use will be unto his glory, unto the Lord. Huh. I know that. That speaks like what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In that time, everything is as unto the Lord. It goes on to say, he says, Anything that is identified when he's talking about the Canaanite, he says, uh, this figure, uh, uh, this identification uses a figure for the moral and spiritual unclean person who will be excluded from the millennial temple. You will be totally excluded from it. And it says, it goes on, before Israel conquered the promised land, the vile Canaanites inhabited it. Thus the term became uh, 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 proverbial in Israel for the moral degradation ceremonially of the unclean person. In other words, when, you, when the Bible says here, the, it says here, no longer be a Canaanite in the house. You cannot be in New Jerusalem or you cannot be in Jerusalem or in the kingdom of God and not sacrifice according. Because there will be no vile thing there. There will be no vile person there. So you have to think about that and understand that what God is doing in that day and time is to, to create an atmosphere where we will glorify his name 
and glorify his name forever. Now, see that I'm a little out of time, but I want to take the time and, and uh, I want to read something, and, and it's been on, uh, it's in Hebrew. Uh, I, I wrestled with this this morning, because I really want to say this, but I want to go to it. Um, I'll go to Hebrew number five, the fifth chapter, um, starting at verse 11, and we're going to read down the verse uh, to six in, in um, verse, we'll read to the sixth chapter. Anyway, so five, Hebrew 5 and 11 says, Concerning him, concerning him, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull in your hearing. This is the writer of Hebrew talking to the Hebrews. He says, For, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. Now let me let me say this. This is a key word here saying elementary, elementary principles of the oracles of God. When you go back to the Jewish nation of the Hebrew nation, they could all quote, even if they couldn't read or write, they could all quote uh, the history of Abraham and their lineage all the way down. They can quote from Abraham down to Moses, down to the Levitical law. They can quote all these things verbally. If you go back to a couple of places in the Bible where Stephen, before he was stoned, when he gave his dissertation, his dissertation was all the way back to Abraham, come up to Moses, come up to where he was today, as he began to tell people, the oracles of God, I can explain them to you. When you go back to Paul, when Paul stood before uh, uh, the, the, the Jerusalem church, he was able to do the same thing. Why? This is called the oracle of God. They can go back and explain who they are, what they know about it, and they're consistent in their teaching about their religion. And it's saying to the Hebrews that, that you should be teachers, but yet you have need of someone to teach you again of those things that are uh, basically elementary principles. He said, number three, for everyone who partake only of milk is not accustomed for the words of righteousness, but he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and, and evil. And listen at this, it says, but solid food is for the mature, who because of practice, because of practice, because of practice, because of practice, not because of some supernatural process, but because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. That's something we just we just naturally know. And we have to naturally know it in order to, uh, for us to survive. It goes on to say, therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of instructions about washing and laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead and elements and eternal judgment. It, it, it is saying here, he says, he said, let's, let's, let's stop this for right now because you, it's not telling you to, to stop doing it. It's saying it's time to move forward and to move on. And what I'm trying to tell people now, particularly in the church, is let us not just keep settling for the same old thing of the elementary things of God. You know, let's move forward into the deepness of God more something, more of a deeper dimension to learn more about what God is saying to us and if God speaks to us through his spirit of grace and if God speaks to us through the spirit of prophecy that we begin to understand what thus said the Lord. And if you do that, what you'll stop doing is keep trying to reach back and save the folk that don't want to be saved. Keep trying to talk to ones over and over again and they keep 
falling into the same thing. Some things you just got to let people along and you have to be able to fend for yourself. And while you're fending for yourself and growing in grace, then you'll be better equipped to speak to the things of God because now you become the oracle of God because now a person who normally would be listening to deep teaching, they'll be listening to deep teaching because you're delivering it. Not Pastor Proctor. Not some other minister. Not Pastor Wood. We, you will be able to go into some deep depth thinking with people because you're reading the Bible and God is giving you a discernment of that because of the type of teaching that you're getting from, from this body. And I think that the more we begin to do that, the more you begin to people, start, as you're talking to people on a daily basis, they say, man, I, I, I never heard that before. I never heard that before. And I was talking to somebody the other day, and, and God bless them, I, I'm not going to call the name, but, but they were really um, uh, what I call uh, um, um, the conviction of their hearts was strong of doing more for God and, and being more in the purpose and the will of God. And um, and I commend them for that. I thought that was a beautiful discussion and, and um, beautiful testimony how they want to do more for God. And I'm saying, you know, to that individual is that we continue to keep teaching and, and getting deep into the Word of God and sharing that with people. So people can have not this 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 fundamental thing of I always just want to pray and lay hands on people. I always want to take people back through the repentance. You look here, some people, no matter what you do, they're going to keep going through the same old route, doing the same old thing. Instead of keep doing that, we want to be in a position where people will be, begin to hear deep teachings, want to know more about God, and they, they don't need to run to a church out to get saved. They'll fall on their face right then and there. Because they didn't heard such a deep word, a deep word that came from you, that they were willing, and, and the anointing that's coming off of you, uh, uh, had that person wanting to give their life to Christ. That's very important. And for us today, it goes on to say, I'm still in Hebrew, sixth chapter. It says, again, it says, um, therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the, about the Christ. Let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of instructions about washing and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavy, heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good work, word of God, and the power of the age to come, and then having fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. For ground that drink the rain, which often falls on it and bring forth vegetation, use those for those sake. It is also till receive the blessing from God. But if it yields thorn and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. What I leave you with today is, is what the Hebrew writer, the writer of Hebrew is saying right here is, you know, pay attention to what's going on. Pay attention to what's going on. God is not talking to those that are truly repentant. There are some people, no matter what they do, whatever you talk to them about, whatever you talk to them about, they're never going to receive the word of God. They're never going to receive the gospel. They're never going to receive Christ. So stop fussing with them. Stop arguing with them. Hey, you're wasting your time. You can't give what's holy to dogs. You just can't. And so in this last day and time, study to show yourself approved. Get into the word of God like you need to get into the word of God. Get deep into the Word of God. Be, get more into these Bible studies. Um, uh, Brother Woodard and I, probably, uh, probably pretty soon, in the, in the days and months to come, we're going to we're gonna do, probably from my home or from the church, we're going to do a, a panel discussion where we'll sit down and have a topic and ask some questions like we did before in the past, and we'll talk about some things about what's going on. And when we do so, we want you to grow in grace, uh, because now is the time for you to ask those questions. Things you don't know about Revelation, 
things that you don't know about prophetic end time, now is the time for you to ask because people are going to need you to be able to answer these questions from them based on your knowledge of the Bible, of the, of the prophetic word, of the spirit of prophecy. You need to know that. Why? Because this is how you're going to get close to people. It's not going to be preaching at them about coming to my church and joining my church. It's going to, well, you need to listen to my pastor. No, they might not ever listen to me, but they will listen to you. And if they're listening to you and you have a deep word and a deep understanding of the Bible because you've been taught properly, you will begin to help somebody. So again, as I close, living in a spiritual catastrophe. Understanding that there's everything that you see happening today is leading us to a catastrophe that is not the end of the world for us. It's the beginning for us as it leads us towards the, 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 the catching away, period. You want to be get caught up in the rapture, as we call it. You want to be there. You want to enjoy that so you can escape the world in this chaotic situation. Unfortunately, there are some people that won't make it, but then they will be delivered through the tribulation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It may be you. You don't know. I doubt it, not if you serve God wholeheartedly. And if that does happen to you, then you will have to remember the teachings of which you've been taught here today of the end time. Because that is what we're trying to do, prepare people. Not so much telling you about, you know, let's get back to church so we can sing hallelujah, praise the Lord. Right now, your hallelujah and praise the Lord should be to God. Your hallelujah is a personal hallelujah right here and now to God. I'm going to pray for you. You're going to pray for me. But your praise is going to be your perfect praise, your personal praise to God. And when you come out, and when you come through, and when you come through the valley, and when we do come back together in such a way that we give a perfect praise unto God, oh man, we're going to lift up our hands and just, just as a corporate worship to God, giving thanks because of who He is and what He has done and what He has brought us through. That's going to be a time, in the time of times. So we thank God for this, and we look forward to Him to do it again. Thank all that are supporting this ministry. Um, thank God for what you guys have been doing and the blessings of, of the members uh, that have been to uh, Proc and I in this ministry. God bless you and may God keep you. As we pray for one last time, I want you to bow your heads with me and I pray. I say, Father, thank you for the word and this teaching. I hope it went out accordingly as you have dictated it. I pray for those that are deeply associated with trying to grow, to help them, Lord God, get deep into the Word and not just always needing a handout, but being a handout for somebody else. Father, equip us. Equip the saints. Teach us. Lead us. Guide us. Order our steps in your Word. Lord, lift up the hung down head and lift up the hand of the feeble. We're praying right now, those that are nervous and those that are, uh, are, are worrying about tomorrow, Lord, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus because tomorrow will take care of itself. Help us to praise and give you thanks today because, Lord, you are wonderful. You are wonderful. You are a father. You are an awesome God. You are Elohim, the creator. And Lord God, if you don't worry about the birds, surely I'm not going to worry about me because you have me in your hands. So we thank you for this. We thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Help us to continue, Lord God, to operate in your will. And if we're not operating in your will, help us to get there one day. In Jesus' name, Lord, we bless everybody on this broadcast that's watching. We speak life. And we don't speak death, we speak blessings, and we speak not only blessings, Lord God, but blessings and a joy. And we don't speak a curse. We pray, God, that you would meet every need of everybody, Lord God, at the sound of my voice. We believe this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I say on the one, I say on the all, fight, watch, and pray. Have a great day. God bless you.